What's up my friends and welcome to the Board Game Design Lab. Today I got a little BGDL Rewind episode and this one comes all the way from May of 2018 where I was talking to Richard Garfield, one of the greatest game designers ever, right? The guy that created Magic the Gathering, King of Tokyo, and just so many other amazing games. And we get into that, we talk about him designing several of these games, but the overall topic is luck versus skill. Richard has some really insightful advice and ideas on that dichotomy of, you know, adding luck versus adding skill versus the tension, trying to find the right balance of those two things in a game. And some of the things he said, a little, a little bit controversial. I had some, uh, some people, you know, got their uh, feathers ruffled just a little bit by some of his, uh, I wouldn't say hot takes, uh, but just interesting ideas as far as luck and what constitutes luck and, and where, where does luck show up in games. And this is just one of my absolute favorite conversations that I've ever had on the show. And so I wanted to bring it back and either share it with you for the first time or remind you of this episode if you heard it back in 2018. Richard, welcome to the show. Hi. Good to be here. Yeah, man. Glad that you're here. I mean, you've designed games, Magic the Gathering, King of Tokyo, Robo Rally, Android Netrunner. I mean, the list just goes on and on of some of the amazing games you've put together. And what I love about your games is they're they're not just like one type of game. Like you have uh, so many different games on the, the spectrum of luck versus skill. And so I'm excited to, to get into it with you today. But just real quick, maybe people have never heard of you. What's your bio? How'd you get into game design? All that good stuff. Uh, sure. Um I was aimed towards an academic career. I was uh, teaching at math and working on my PhD when uh, I finished Magic and it came out and that sort of uh, uh, took me away from uh, the academic world and into game design. Before that, I had been serious about game design, but I had been uh, into it as a hobby. Uh, I decided that game design was really a poor place to stake your future. Um, uh, I was uh, pr probably probabilistically, I was right, but, uh, but the world has changed now also. And so things are a lot better for uh, game designers all over. After magic came out, I worked with uh, wizards of the coast for maybe six years and did a bunch of games with them, including uh, uh, several more trading card games. And uh, since then I left, uh, formed a consulting company, uh, Three Donkeys, and from Three Donkeys have worked on game design uh, textbook, taught some, uh, done a lot of game design consultation, and uh, designed uh, a lot of games as well. And uh, I've always been interested in games in their totality. Uh, I, I like uh, seeing games including children's games, sports, party games, strategy games, war games. I like to see them all as in uh, one family and uh, have tried to diversify myself as much as possible. Yeah, for sure. Now, Magic came out, what, in the early 90s? Am I remembering that right? Yeah, 93. Yeah, and so <laughs> how surprised were you that it took off and, and did the way that it did and kind of took you down this road? Uh, I was... Uh, very surprised, perpetually surprised for years where uh, I would hear some report about how well it was doing and it was sort of continually uh, exceeding expectation. Um, I never, uh, I never really, I never dreamed that. Uh, I knew that magic was a good game because my play testers couldn't stop playing it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I also knew that there were a lot of games I loved, which weren't particularly successful. So, uh, that was sort of what I was expecting. Yeah. And magic has done such an incredible job of bringing so many people into the hobby. It was one of the first games I ever got into and I was in college. That's, that's what my friends were playing. They kind of hooked me in and, and a whole bunch of uh, packs of cards later, I had all these decks and we were playing. And that's actually what led me into board games in general. I know there's a lot of people who have a very similar story. And so it's just really cool to see how, how games have changed since then. And all, but I'm excited to get into the topic. So let's talk about luck versus skills. This is something you've talked about in the past. But before we get rolling, give me just a good definition of luck and a good definition of skill. What do you, what do you say that those things are? Well, that... Uh that gets to the crux of it, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, they are hard to design. Sorry, they are hard to define. Um, and a lot of people's confusion over luck and skill, I think, often comes from uh, 
valid definitions, but that are sort of self-contradictory. So in different contexts, they will mean different things. So, but in general, the way I define luck is the amount of variance in, ga in, in the game. So uh, uh, if, if there's a, a lot of swing in how it plays out among players of about equal skill, then that's a measure of luck. There's a lot of luck, or sorry, of disparate skill. Uh, of equal skill, that's all that's got always going on is that uh, that swing, and uh, how consistently people can win when they're better than one another. That's a measure of skill. Gotcha. And so, kind of what you're talking about, the crux of the issue. You've talked in the past about this kind of false dichotomy people have of luck versus skill, putting those two things on opposite ends of the spectrum. You don't see it that way. So, tell me a little bit more about what you, how you see it, and kind of what you mean by this false dichotomy. It's very common to hear people say, "Oh, the game is all luck." or there's, uh, there's uh, no skill in the game because it's all luck. Um, and, and I definitely uh, see it as being more of, a, uh, of a, a continuum, a plane. You can have high luck, high skill, low luck, low skill, and anywhere in between. Now, the, the, the statement that something with high luck can't have high skill isn't entirely incorrect. What that, uh, what that, is, what that means is if the payoff for for your skill is low, then it'll have higher luck. If it, if the payoff for your uh, luck is high, then you'll have lower skill. So so the amount of benefit you get for your skill and luck uh, do vary with one another. But the thing is that, that when people say, "Oh, it's uh, high luck," and so therefore low skill, um, and they it's, it's usually said in sort of a dismissive way. That is true. Your skill won't have as high a payoff, but by most people's definition, it'll have just as much skill, possibly. So to illustrate that, uh, I use toy games to illustrate game concepts. And uh, toy games are games which uh, um, you wouldn't play because they're not meant to be fun, but they do illustrate something which is really easy to see. So one of the games which uh, I developed to demonstrate that point is uh, rando chess. And so in rando chess, what you do is you play it, you play a game of chess, and then afterwards, you roll a die, and if you roll a one, then the winner is the loser, and the loser is the winner. Okay, so everybody would agree that has more luck than chess, but it is also pretty clear that by most people's definition of luck, it has the same skill as chess. You're going to have exactly the same if you did if you played this on a, a world scale. You would have the same people with high ratings would be rated high on this game if they're rated high in chess and it would uh, be ex every book on strategy would apply to this game as well um and you can tweak this as much as you like right you can uh, you can make it so that 49 percent of the time you switch side you know, switch the results and uh, and so there it's almost entirely luck but still there's just as much skill so illustrations of uh games at the various uh, checkpoints you would say that uh, chess or go is uh uh, high skill, low luck. Poker is high skill, high luck. Roulette is no skill, high luck. Uh, and uh, tic-tac-toe might be low skill and low luck. Gotcha. Now, I'm, I'm intrigued by this whole toy games thing. This is something I've actually heard you speak on in the past. I think the listeners of the podcast would really benefit from. Can you tell me some more of the, the toy games you've come up with and kind of the concepts that you prove through those games? Yeah. Uh, uh, so here's a good one. Um, and in fact, relevant to this uh, this talk of luck versus skill, my definition of luck implies that there's luck in a game like chess. Okay, not much. It's a high skill game, low luck, but there is some, and people often have uh, trouble accepting that. And many people, even after thinking about it a long time, don't accept it. But the toy game I developed to illustrate that point is uh, uh, called Guess a Digit of Pi. And so in this game, I give you uh, a number, say 3,470,000, and you have to guess what that digit of pi is, the 3,470,000th digit. And you've got five minutes. Now, and you can't use Google or anything like that. Um, so that is uh, totally deterministic. And for almost everyone, uh, the, their chances of winning it are one in 10. It's a game of pure luck. But... You could calculate it, and uh, and you might even have it memorized uh, if you were really serious about this game. Um, and uh, um, so so this works uh, to show how complexity luck can come about. 
And uh, so in practice, this guess a digit of pi is very much like chess. The human brain isn't built for it, and you sort of manage it as much as you can. And in practice, it comes down to a coin toss, which uh, most people accept. Now, in chess, there's this just wonderful uh, set of heuristics which you use to improve your game. And it's, it's very uh, uh, it's, uh, enjoyable and addictive to explore it and improve upon it. But when you make a call between two close moves, you're uh, using these imperfect heuristics. And basically, you've got these two doors of complexity, which you can't see through. And you're going to choose one and you're going to open it. And, and maybe there's a winning game down there. Maybe there isn't. Uh, you don't really know. If you knew, you'd be playing tic-tac-toe. And so that's how luck comes into a game like chess. And that's how uh, a toy game might illustrate that. Yeah, and so how much of this is just just down to people's perceptions? Because a lot of times they'll say, oh, there's too much luck in that game. And maybe it's because they lost and they just hope that there was a lot of luck and, and to kind of cover up, you know, maybe they weren't playing very well or as effectively as they wanted to. How much of it is just perception? Well, a lot of it is perception. Uh, the Too much luck in a There are, of course, different players with different tastes and some people will like less luck and more luck. Can they identify what luck is? Oftentimes, they will be mistaken about what the luck is, and certainly, if they see a lot of luck, they often assume there's not much skill. But oftentimes, they're right. So one of the one of the places where uh, players might justly say there's too much luck is uh, if they feel like the game is uh, often decided by one luck event, mm -hmm. and that that can be really frustrating to players, particularly if the game is longer. And so, so if they play for 45 minutes and they feel like it was all decided by who went first, uh, which was a coin toss or, you know, who rolled the six at the end, that's okay once in a while. But, uh, but if that's sort of how the game often plays out, it feels bad. But they often blame luck more. They, they identify luck as being bad there, which is true. It's sort of tacked on. But you can say the same thing about uh, skill events as well. You could have a 45-minute game that's very skill-testing, but then it's all tested by this one particular skill. And I guess a toy game to illustrate that might be uh, you, you play chess, but then at the end you determine who won the game by an arm wrestling match. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's tacked on in the same way that this die roll in the game is tacked on. So a lot of uh, my design, when I'm trying to mitigate the luck it's often less a matter of reducing the luck than sort of baking it in so it doesn't feel like it's tacked in so it feels like it's spread out a little more gotcha i want to i want to talk talk to you about that in just a second but going back to the toy games are these things that you come up with just for fun just kind of pondering and daydreaming or do you come up with these concepts while you're working on a game design or something like that to kind of help you along in your process uh, yeah, I don't use them for game design. Uh, I use them uh, when I'm thinking about games in general. Um, so if I identify something which I like in a game or don't like, uh, I'll often try to think about what the game design implications are of it. And and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, academically interested in games. The, the, the book I wrote with uh, uh, two co-authors is uh, Characteristics of Games, and we use a lot of uh, toy toy games in these books to sort of demonstrate things. But uh, when you think about uh, a characteristic of games, like its complexity, skill, its luck, uh, oftentimes you're wrestling with a lot of different casual definitions. And so when you begin trying to pin down what you actually mean, it often helps to come up with toy games to sort of uh, see what that feels like. Gotcha. Now you mentioned that that book was a textbook. Is that, I mean, is that used in college classes or high school classes, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, it's used in college classes. Very cool, man. Yeah, I'm working on some things. I, I teach high school. I teach 10th and 12th grade, and we're working on some gamification kind of things right now. And so I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I need to check out your, your book. It might be some things I could bring into my classroom with helping these kids kind of understand what we're doing game-wise. Sure. Uh, and so all right, let's talk about how designers can use luck to make better games. Now, there's some players out there that say, no luck, take out all the luck, and that'll make it the best game possible. But I don't believe that. I don't think you believe that. So how can we use luck to make better board games? Well, uh, actually, by my definition of luck, I don't think they think it either. <laughs> um, because, as I said, I think there's luck in chess. Right. Um, so uh, what they're really interested in is what sort of luck is there. 
And this luck and chess, another way to illustrate it is uh, when you watch kids play tic-tac-toe. Hmm. Most of your audience has probably mastered tic-tac-toe probably uh, quite a while ago. And uh, they dismiss it perhaps without thinking about it too much. But if you actually watch like kids playing for the first time and even for years after that, it's it's actually a real game. And uh, you see this uh, progression that they take, which seems like it has to be analogous to how we, we're playing chess. They begin out and it's random. And you know, it's totally random. It's frustrating to see, well, the first kid that sees they can get the third, if the third uh, X in a row, that they're going to win. Oh, they missed it, right? <laughs> or they didn't see they could block it, block something, and uh, and and it it feels like chance. And then they begin uh, learning things like uh, how to spot a threat, how to spot, how to block a threat, how to set up double threats, and eventually uh, they get to a point where they've mastered the game, and whoever goes first either wins or or or, uh, or gets a draw. So. It's really not a matter to me of uh, how much luck there is. It's, well, it's often a matter of how much luck there is, but uh, it's, uh, for most people who are critical of luck, it's what sort of luck it is. Uh, they often don't like dice. Um, they often don't like cards. These are overt luck elements. But then there's game theoretic luck, uh, for instance, uh, where, where we both secretly choose a strategy at the same time. So rock, paper, scissors, most people would say uh, has a lot of luck in it. Uh, but it is, if you look at it right, also totally deterministic. And there actually is skill to it in practice. Uh, if you're playing against somebody who's rolling a die, there's no skill. But if you're playing against you know, your little brother or something uh, and you're trying to uh, outguess each other, there actually is skill. And when you extend game theoretic things to, uh, to more broadly to uh, other games, uh, then there's a lot of this uh, predict what your opponent does. And uh, if you do that correctly, you'll get some sort of advantage. That's luck too. That's often very acceptable to the people who don't like uh, don't like luck in their games or don't like air quotes luck in their games. Yeah, and so it's it's about the luck that the these people prefer. Like you said, it's it's lucky if I guess what strategy you're going to do or what you're going to pick and all that. That that's a lucky guess for the most part. But I guess I would say if I did that, then I I had some skill based knowledge and I made these good decisions and all that. Assuming I got it right, and if I got it wrong, I'd say, oh, this is all just luck. Is that kind of how it would work? That, that certainly can be how it works. Uh, I think all these things wind down to uh, people, like when I say there's luck in chess, that's deeply disturbing to some players because they're very tied up in this dichotomy of uh, if there's luck, then there's no skill or, or that it somehow reduces the skill. Right. And, and all these games sort of have this... Uh, Game theoretic luck is is marvelous because it's uh, it's it's so hard to gauge how much of it is skill and how much of it is luck. And in the end, it's always going to be some percentage. Like you might be a very skillful player, which means you guess correctly eighty percent of the time. And uh, but that but that's really eighty percent of the time. That means sometimes you miss guess, and you know is that luck? Uh, is that skill? Well, the fact that you get it eighty percent of the time is is certainly skill, and the fact that you sometimes fail is part of the luck. Yeah, it's funny. I'm I'm sitting here thinking about like I come out of a, a athlete football background, and just thinking back, like it seems that the the guys that had the most skill also tended to be the most lucky. Like the ball bouncing just the way it needed to to them to you know for them to make a play or score or something like that. And so it's kind of interesting to think about how we say, oh, that was just a lucky play, but it tends to happen more often to skilled players than it does to unskilled players. Well, that's a uh, when when you embrace uh, luck as something you work with in your skill, you right. get a, a very rich area of games. And, uh, and I, I think oftentimes the people who are very interested in deterministic games don't really appreciate that part of gameplay, which is okay. You know, there's lots of games out there for everybody. But uh, I personally uh, like games where crazy, unlucky things can happen and then as a player, uh, I have to figure out how to deal with that. I don't just flip the table and say, oh, this game is garbage. Right. Um, and uh, and maybe I lose, but maybe I have an epic comeback. And, and maybe I put all my eggs in one basket and I'm hoping for the lucky roll that will bring me back into the game. And then people will look at that one lucky roll and say, you got lucky. 
And, and, and I'll say, well, that's true. But the only reason I had to get lucky is because I got so unlucky earlier. That's a, a sort of a common a, a story that comes up in card games a lot. Uh, early on, they were announcing the first big tournaments of Magic, and we got on some of the announcers because they they were following the game very closely, and they were saying, oh, he has to top deck the right card to win here. He top decked it. It's crazy. How did he do that? <laughs> but if you looked at the previous, like, 10 turns, he could have drawn that card any time during there and won the game, yeah. right? And and but they're just looking at this last one event and saying, "Oh, it was all draw, all determined by that uh, uh, that one top deck. It was entirely a, a, a win of luck." But it, you have to look at the game as a whole, not just this one event. Right, absolutely. And and it's also a skill to build a deck in Magic where you have the opportunity to win like that. I mean, that is very much a skill in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And another illustration of luck in a game like Magic, uh, uh, early on we were playing sealed deck games. So those games were, are ones where you're uh, given a deck and some, uh, some boosters, and you have to strip it down to a deck and you play a tournament. And we were trying to make that a part of the Pro Tour and, uh, and, and get people to play it seriously. And we, and we did it for a while. But we had some, uh, I remember having some French players who complained that this format was all luck and they always lost. <laughs> and they they did not see that that's uh, that, that is a, a, a contradiction right there. If it's all luck, you can't always lose. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There would be some kind of percentage of you winning, so at least right. some of the time, right? <laughs> Definitely. All right, so earlier you talked about mitigating luck and, and finding ways to bake it into the game. So it's a little, uh, it's harder to see. It doesn't feel tacked on. Give me some ways that you do that or some good ways that you've seen other people do it. But just tell me about how you, how do you bake that luck mitigation in so players enjoy it without even realizing it? There's, there's a lot of different techniques and it takes a lot of different forms and, and you might, uh, it's, it's actually analogous to uh, making it so that there's no strategic element which dominates either. So, uh, but that's often easier to see. So, for example, if you have a card game and uh, you score single points for the first two hands and then the third hand because you want the game to be exciting at the end, you make it count 10 times points. Well, that's not going to sit well because the first two games are kind of almost a waste of time. Right. Um, and so you mitigate that by making it so, uh, well, uh, maybe it's two times or maybe there's just a bonus for the winner, a flat bonus. You try to soften that. And so it's a similar thing with luck where uh, you're making it so that uh, a particular card isn't the I win the game card, but, uh, but that it can give you an advantage under the right circumstances in particular if you... Uh, uh, plan for it or or something like that so you you make it you make the powerful cards ones that you have to plan a little bit more for and uh, the the uh, very lucky events not dominate the game but give a person uh, time to uh, recover from things like that or you can make the game short mm -hmm. uh, which is all, often a way to uh, deal if you've got a game where uh, the luck feels uh, like it's tacked on, then sometimes what you just need is a shorter game because you can make it about play the game, assuming there's some skill. You know, maybe you get your 60% chance to win and you uh, roll the die, you win or not, and then you go on and play another game. And uh, over the course of the evening, you, uh, you you sort of stitch them together into a one longer uh, session, which is inevitably more strategic also, a little less luck. Gotcha. Now, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, how luck can bring this drama to a game. And, and I love, that's one of the things I love about games is how they, they emulate real life. It's a little bit chaotic. There's lucky things that happen, lucky breaks and chances and all that. But talk to me about how you kind of use luck to build that drama in, in some of your games. I'm thinking about like King of Tokyo. It's like, okay, I just need that one, this one die roll, and then I'll have enough damage to kill you, and then I'll be the winner. Like, What are some ways that you've really brought drama into your games through luck? My games, uh, I often try to just uh, make sure that there's a certain amount of luck involved. Um, and and I think that when you have it and it's integrated into the game in a good way, you naturally get this uh, dramatic element. The players can get lucky or unlucky, and uh, if the game progresses longer, that fortune can reverse. Um, this is in contrast to a game where uh, it's low luck and you often, and, and sometimes in those games, uh, if you aren't as skilled as the other player, you get off to a bad start, 
you feel like you can't catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, luck is a, a marvelous way to get come from behind victories, uh, and to, and to see that happen is is, ve is very satisfying often. Uh, and that's you know really uh, when you start thinking about what makes drama in a game, uh, that's one of the big things: is can your plans be disrupted? That's drama. And can you come from behind and actually win? That's drama. And luck really helps both those things happen. Yeah, for sure. I know one of the worst feelings in games is if I'm playing a game and I know it's over and I know I have no chance of winning, but I still have to play out the next five turns just to get to the end where you win or somebody else wins. Like That's not enjoyable where luck can kind of change that a little bit. And if you think about what a story is at its heart, it's tension and resolution. And luck has a great way of just introducing tension into a game that can be resolved in some really dramatic ways. There's a game I, I really like called uh, Quadradius. And uh, it's a it's a computer game. Uh, you can play it on the web. Um, and uh, it's got a, a small, dedicated audience. And uh, every once in a while I play it and I get really into it for a month and then I have to quit because it's too addictive. <laughs> but it is a huge amount of luck in it. You've got these chess pieces and you're basically moving around and trying to squash the other person's chess pieces. But then these power-ups appear randomly and you jump on them. And your chess piece gets uh, a special power which your opponent doesn't know about. And these powers are very swingy. And so then there's bluffing because uh, if you've got a powered up piece and you move into a particular area, it might be a, they might interpret it as a threat and retreat, but it's not a threat because you've got garbage, a garbage power. And, uh, and I've taught this to uh, other players or I've got them to play it. And, and oftentimes they'll play it and they say, oh, you know, it's like my opponent got this power up and I just lost. It was ridiculous. It's just too much luck. But the thing is that the more you play it, the more you realize that what the luck is doing for the game uh, for example, when I'm playing against a better player and I get the upper hand, it's like I cannot slowly win the game, like uh, be, be, play the sort of game which I'm really comfortable be, doing, which is, is sort of slowly tightening the, tightening the noose. Because the longer I go, the longer they have a chance to pick up, the, to, to pick up something which their skill uh, will allow them to... Uh, turn into a weapon against me and and bring bring themselves back into the game and so you get these situations where uh, a, a just a game a, a normal game if there was a, a very it was a low luck game you look at it and say oh this player's definitely won the number of times in this game you've seen that turn around it just it makes it uh, very exciting yeah definitely all right so talk to me about like your process when you're working on a game you got a design of of balancing the luck and the skill and trying to tweak things so it's at just the right place where you want it to be not that it's you know one or the other but that it's kind of in that place of, of your of the experience you're trying to create right i don't see them as a dichotomy but i do see luck versus skill as a uh, uh how much the the payoff is for the player like how much you can leverage your skill yeah. and uh I look for the, the, the some of the key things I look for is if players frequently get into a situation where other players don't feel like they can catch up, I begin to wonder if there's too much skill in the game because because that's sort of a sign of too much skill. And uh, and if players don't feel like it matters what they do, then that's a sign there might be too much luck in the game. And uh, this is going to change from audience to audience, but uh, but uh, that in my playtest groups, that's that's what I look look for. That reminds me of a uh, another uh, toy game sort of. A, since I define skill, the way I define skill is that the more skillful player should always win, uh, and if they don't, that's bad luck. Uh, that makes sort of the ultimate high skill game being a, a game like who's taller. And uh, and uh, so if I've got a uh, I'm I'm five foot ten and I've got a six foot three players every time we play that I lose, and uh, uh, that's uh, and and sprinting is often uh, another example of like a very high skill game. The better sprinter is almost always going to win, and against me they will always win. Yeah. Definitely. All right. And so when you're like in that playtesting process, what are you what are you looking at? Are, are you looking at like how players respond to certain elements of the game or, or kind of their experience uh, like as you watch them around the table? Like what do you look for when they're experiencing your games and, and how do you kind of tweak things accordingly? Oftentimes with playtesters, there's a lot of interpretation to what they say. They often think something's wrong with the game. 
And if they think there's something wrong with the game, there is something wrong with the game. Uh, but oftentimes they can't put their finger on it and their explanation for it isn't exactly what it is. So I, I often try to listen to what they're, uh, I listen to what they're saying, but then I try to think of what the underlying problem really is. And so uh, with regards to luck versus skill, the way it might come out is that they're trying to play a particular strategy and it isn't working and they don't feel like they can play it any better to get it to work. Now, there's no rule saying every strategy has to be usable. And in fact, that's a formula for a non-game because if every strategy is useful, then then there really is no strategy. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, in Magic, if I want to play the strategy of all lands, you know, I'll lose. But there's no reason why that has to be a viable strategy. But if in Magic I want to play an all spell deck and I really feel like it, like that should be possible... Um, and I, I can't do it uh, because the spells don't, you know, all say they all reference creatures or something like that. Um, then I might start saying, being frustrated and saying, oh, the spells aren't powerful enough. Now, what I'm, uh, I'm saying the spells aren't powerful enough, but what I'm uh, really responding to is the fact that I want to do this thing and I can't do it. So as a designer, you've got to understand, you've got to sort of decipher that and uh, decide, should this thing be something which is a part of the game? Uh, and oftentimes it's like, oh, that's a cool idea. I hadn't even thought about trying to do that. Let's, you know, throw some elements into the game, uh, tweak the, the point payoff or the types of cards out there to make that more viable. And, uh, and, and then uh, uh, get that strategy to be, uh, to be something that works. Yeah, definitely. Now, were there any cards or, or I'm trying to think of the right word for in magic like any kind of themes or mechanisms that you came up with they were just way too lucky they were just way too swingy and players just hated that you had to like pull it out uh i i have had many many different magic cards which have pulled been been pulled for many different reasons uh like i remember i think you've talked about like the pixies or something like that in the past it was just like this crazy kind of thing yeah the pixies uh the pixies were ones where that when they hit the opponent, you would swap two cards between your hands. And uh, I wouldn't say that got pulled because it was too much luck. It was just because uh, people began to value their cards and they didn't want to be, you know, trading their whatever $30 card for, uh, for the other person's sticky land. Right. Cause it was permanent, um, right? It wasn't like just during yeah. the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so uh, that's an example. I've, I've had, uh, again, many, many, many cards pulled, uh, uh, for many reasons, uh, uh, I wouldn't put that on lock, but uh, but that was most, was one that was pulled. And uh, I, I, I'm actually I'm, I'm sure there there is a a correct answer to this that, that that I've had some that were too too luck dependent. The thing is that with magic, you can often tweak it so that it does work. And I'm I'm pretty sure there were some cases where we couldn't figure out a good way to tweak it. But like. If you came up with something which was uh, a coin toss card, which is too powerful, well, you can just increase the cost or make it so it's a little less powerful. You tweak it, and then you can get it in. Right. And, and oftentimes, that, that's all it is in, in a game like Magic. It's just uh, um, it doesn't have to be a card which is uh, uh, luck luck based, like a coin toss card, uh, but it can just be like a you know a, a, a super conditional powerful card, uh, like. A, you know, if, if you draw this and your opponent has a s swamp and a mountain in play, and uh, then then you do twenty points of damage, right? That's you know, it's like that. That would be like if I chose to play that and I was playing against the right person and I drew it at the right time. That'd be too much luck. Yeah. Um, um, and and if you uh, uh, lowered it to the point where it was uh, where it wasn't too much luck, it probably wouldn't be worth you know interesting to play. So then, yeah, you drop it. it. It would make for a fun story, and it would be quite dramatic, though. Just be like, "Hey, I win." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, you talked a moment ago about the kind of ratio—not necessarily ratio, but like thinking about the time a game takes if the, if it is heavily luck dependent and all that. Do you think there's a certain like ratio of time and luck tolerance for players? Uh, yeah, I mean, players, different players will have a different tolerance. Uh, usually. The more luck in the game, the shorter they'll want that game to be. Um, but I think 
that's something which is sort of a cultural standard we have right now. I'm not sure that it's uh, that's in stone that that's the best way to be. And it actually ties back to one of your examples or your, your comment. Uh, there's a lot of luck in life. Hmm. There is. Life has a lot of luck. It certainly has a lot of skill and is longer than most games. <laughs> right. And it's very fascinating. Yeah. And so uh, using that as a model, uh, you can think, well, you can probably have a game which lasts a long time, has a lot of luck and a lot of skill. And I can think back to you know growing up, uh, games that fit that description, like uh, um, Titan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Titan is a marvelous uh, game, Avalon Hill, uh, early 80s, I think it came out. And you, you accumulate these armies of monsters, you move around the map, and then you, uh, when you attack somebody, you zoom in and you have a little, a, a little tiny war game. Now, there is an enormous amount of luck in the game uh, because you're rolling the dice to move and because within the little battles, you're rolling dice to see if you hit or not. And uh, I've had situations, for example, where my opponent had an ogre which uh, rolls six dice and hits on a six. And I had an angel, which has six hit points, and they hit killed it in one blow, mm. right? They rolled six sixes, mm. right? An insane amount of luck. But there's uh, the, the more skillful players will win that game, which often lasts three hours, much more often than anybody else. So it's a, um, so if you've got a large, long game with uh, lots of luck, it has to be like it is in Titan, uh, and as we talked about earlier, sort of baked in, where you might notice, wow, that was really unlucky for me to lose that angel there. But the thing is that during the course of the game, I'm rolling hundreds of dice, right? And so, you know, it, it you might get 10% more lucky than me, or 10% less, and sometimes you get might, might, in a particular place, get much more lucky than me. And if you're skillful, you might be able to leverage that to victory, but if uh, if you're not, then, you know, I'll get, uh, you know, I'll be able to work my way back. Yeah, for sure. I think poker falls into this category. Because, uh, I mean, you, you have poker, they have those World Series of poker tournaments that last days. But And that's a lot of luck in there, but yet at the same time, the people that get to that final table, it's almost the same people every single year. It's, it's very, very similar in that top, you know, top 20, 30 people that are, that are there. And so is it just the amount of time? Like, talk to me about poker. Like, help me understand, because poker and uh, has a lot of characteristics of other you know, board games and card games. And so how can people kind of capture that same thing? There's a lot of luck and a lot of skill that, you know, for their own games. Poker is probably my favorite game. Uh, it illustrates uh, so many really cool aspects of games, um, and a lot of them aren't really uh, in the mainstream design sensibility. Right. But it, it, uh, it's, it's very modular, for one. So it, a hand of poker is, uh, uh, there's a lot of luck in it. Anybody can win. Uh, I can beat the world champion in poker in one hand. Um, but you begin stringing them together, and the fact that the world champion in poker has whatever, uh, 65% advantage on me, it doesn't take long for 65% advantage to add up to, wow, they're going to win uh, an enormous amount of the time. And, uh, and so you, you start putting these uh, hands of poker together. What you define as being the game is, uh, is really important. Like, is the hand of poker a game? Well, that's a very short, very high luck affair. Or is the session of poker the game? Or is the tournament of poker? Or is your uh, season of poker? Right. All these things uh, are related to this hand of poker, but they've all got very different skill um, and very different lengths of play. And uh, that, that is one way you can uh, really always uh, bring out the skill in your game is play multiple sessions. Um, in a game like Titan, you don't have to because uh, the game is long, filled with luck, and the multiple sessions are very baked in. It's all these different battles you have. Um, and uh, But in a, a game like Magic, uh, one hand isn't as satisfying as playing a match. Uh, and playing three out of five is even more satisfying than playing two out of two out of three often. And playing a tournament is more skill testing than just playing against your buddy. And uh, and so there's all sorts of ways to mitigate the luck by stringing together your play sessions. 
Definitely. And I think that's going back to sports. This is where we look into, okay, you have the season of play, and then that leads into, you know, and there's, there's skill, there's luck, there's all, things, or all sorts of things that happen there. But to determine the champion, it's usually like a best of seven series. Like, can you win four games and not just get lucky for that one? And I think, you know, because any, anything can happen for during one specific basketball game or baseball game and different, you know, especially baseball, goodness gracious, like the way the ball bounces, just <laughs> goes, it's crazy. And so, but the, the more you play, the more you kind of get into, the better team typically is going to win. Yeah. The uh, one aspect, positive aspect of luck that we haven't really touched on is that it allows uh, wider audiences to play against one another. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that's one of the things I really look for. I, I, I get, I, I, I very much like high skill, low luck games, games where luck doesn't have much payoff, but, for me to play those, uh, if I'm playing with friends who have already sort of gotten into the game, it's a while before I feel like I can uh, can compete with them. Um, but if they're uh, high luck payoff, and ideally for me, high skill as well, then even if they're entrenched, I can play the first time and get lucky. And uh, uh, I may not win, but uh, I can make them sweat, which is nice. And then uh, that gives me a chance to sort of build up. Um, I like games that you can play uh, with both advanced and beginning players and that they can have a good time together. And that's one of the reasons why uh, poker is so amazing, uh, certainly, is that case with poker. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm thinking about King of Tokyo. I have brought so many people into the hobby of gaming through King of Tokyo because anybody can play that game. You just sit down. Here's the you know the five rules of the game, you know the five main rules, and we're going to roll some dice. It's going to take 20 minutes, and we're going to have a lot of laughs and fun. And then those people are like, oh, I didn't realize this was gaming. And then they start kind of getting deeper and deeper and, and, you know, then they're hooked and then they're buying a bunch of games. And so, like, like you said, it broadens the, the audience. It broadens the horizon. Ticket to Ride. And, you know, how many millions of people have played Ticket to Ride because of it, it? it's so easy and the luck of, you know, it's luck of drawing the right cards and getting the right routes and all that stuff, you know, but it, it brings so many people in. What are you, what would you say are some of the other benefits of having games with a little more luck than, than skill? Uh, I'd say the main benefits for luck, the ones I uh, think about most often, are the, it allows a game with a little more luck allows broader audiences to play, and it gives players unexpected play situations. Um, and the uh, a, a game a game which is more deterministic will tend to follow more similar routes over time. Uh, a game with a little more luck. Uh, you'll spin into unexplored territory more easily. And then uh, I usually list a, a, a last uh, advantage to luck, uh, having luck in your game, which is it gives somebody to blame their losses on. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure how important that is. I mean, I guess it's important. Uh, maybe, maybe I've just moved beyond caring whether I win and lose that much. But uh, it always uh, amazes me when players sit down to the first game, the, the first game, and they can get really upset about winning or losing. It's like games are so like, like one of the, the, one of the amazing things about games is that they, you, you just can't master them. I mean, you know, most games immediately and that any game worth playing is going to take repeated plays. Right. And, uh, um, so, so anyway, but, uh, but yeah, uh, having a little bit of luck in the game says, Oh, I just didn't allow the player to say, Oh, I, 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 I just got unlucky. I played perfect strategy. <laughs> right. um, it protects the ego a bit. And I think in our culture, our society winning is so important. We put such a premium on winning and I think it just kind of spills over into gaming in some really kind of ugly ways sometime. Well, Richard, do you have any advice for somebody? They're, they're working through a game design right now. They're trying to figure out the balance and, and you know put the right amount of luck and the right amount of skill. What advice would you give them just in general? I always look at what sort of uh, variance or luck is in the game. And, uh, and I would advise them to think about what is there and how they're going to use it. Um, so uh, some ex something that's really powerful and uh, I, I would I would uh, tell them to try to use uh, game theoretic luck. So game theoretic luck is um, 
where you know something that I don't know. Okay, so this can be added to a lot of different games. Uh, um, you can have a little secret goal card uh, where you're trying to do something, and I don't know what that is, and you get a little bonus there. Um, and, and, uh, but anytime you've got a hand of cards or a single card or anything that the other person doesn't know, um, you can make the entire rest of the game deterministic. And that little bit of hidden information will, uh, will help add a little bit of variance that people won't even recognize as luck. Uh, if they don't like that sort of thing. And uh, so oftentimes, if you're trying to do a low luck game, high skill game, getting a little bit of that game theoretic luck in is, uh, will, will give you a lot more replayability and uh, str- spread your audience out, allow wider audiences to play with each other. If you're going with uh, dice, dice are um, uh, oftentimes hated by many players I, I think if you uh, use the dice often enough, that's okay. That's getting back to this uh, Titan experience where you roll the dice a thousand times over the course of three hours. But these days, nobody's doing three-hour games. So uh, then uh, I've begun thinking about uh, using dice more often as, uh, instead of a fail mechanism, a choice mechanism, an option mechanism. So uh, what that means is is oftentimes in games, uh, in, like in Titan, this this happens, uh, uh, you roll and see whether you succeeded or not. Um, a lot of players hate that. Uh, and with a short game, you know, if you're playing 45 minutes, it's often frustrating because you don't like to try to do something and then fail. But that doesn't mean you can't have dice. What you need to do is have it so that the dice are giving you options instead of uh, succeed and fail. So that's what's going on in a game like, well, like Yahtzee or King of Tokyo, where you're rolling the dice and they don't have uh, necessarily a, a fixed fail state. They're giving you an opportunity. You can take a higher risk opportunity. You can take a lower risk. Oftentimes you can get some little payout even if you fail, uh, failed uh, in some ways. And, uh, and uh, players uh, tend to like dice more when they're giving them opportunities and choices rather than just fail and succeed. Yeah, definitely. That's one thing I found. I've, I've been working on a superhero game last few months, and it's dice based, but you roll the dice before you act. And so you roll these dice, and they give you certain icons, and that kind of gives you uh, your options for what you can do on that turn. And so it's not, hey, I'm, I maybe can do this. It's okay, I can do this, and how do I? Mo- what's the most efficient way I can use my actions, use my my dice? And, and so I guess that's the difference between input randomness versus output randomness, and kind of what what people prefer. Now, Richard, do you have any kind of closing thoughts, any, any final ideas or something, you know, you just want to lead the listeners with? Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, uh, my general advice would be to try instead of trying to, uh, systematically remove all the luck from games would be to, uh, uh, try to leave some in and, uh, even crank it up and see if your players will accept it. Uh, games are definitely not one size fits all. Uh, there's, uh, different audiences will respond to different things. But uh, um, everybody likes to be able to play with their friends. And if a game's audience is too narrow, they may not be able to do that. And uh, uh, using luck in the right ways can help mitigate that. Awesome. Well, Richard, man, I really appreciate you coming on the show. We're about to head over into a bonus round. We're going to talk about Richard's advice for designing a collectible card game, something like Magic or uh, one of the living card games that are out now. So I'm going to get his advice on that. But Richard, again, really Appreciate your time, and good luck with everything you got going on right now. Oh, thanks a lot. It's been fun. All right, so bonus round. Let's talk about collectible card games. The, the thing you you really got going, you know, 25 years ago. It's kind of, does that seem crazy to you that Magic was like 25-ish years ago? Uh, yeah, it does seem crazy-ish. <laughs> uh, it does seem crazy, um, and it, uh, it's been, all, I think, exactly 25 years now since it was released. Um yeah, uh, games have come a long way since then. Yeah, all right, so let's let's get your advice. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. You've worked on I don't know how many sets of Magic. I know you're not you're not in on all of them at this point, but you still come along and kind of consult and help out and do different things. So tell me, give me some good advice if let's say I wanted to come up with a collectible card game or I guess living card game is kind of the model people are using now, and so maybe that's a better way to go, but what would be your advice to somebody working on one of those kinds of games? I've got lots of different go-to uh, concepts for uh, putting these things together. Um, the first, uh, which I learned uh, maybe on my third game, no, my second game, 
uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle, I, I learned, um, is that you want to make them short. When Magic came, first came out, I was actually pretty lucky that I made it as short as it is, uh, because my standards at the time was this is a board or card game. Boards and card games that I'm used to playing are 45 minutes minimum, and two hours is certainly okay. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out, and this is uh, pretty obvious now, is that, uh, is that these trading card games uh, really want to be short. And the reason why is because you want to play them once, and then you want to change your deck and then play them again. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you make it so that the length of the game is one sitting, you're not going to be able to do that in one sitting. Um, but if you make it so that the uh, length of play is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, then then you'll be able to play it and say, oh, I wonder well, how, how this would have worked if I swapped out this card. That's very satisfying for players, and it's a, it's a, a, a large part of the reason why people play doesn't mean that a longer one can't work. It just means that it's going to be much, uh, it's going to uh, be harder for people to get into and require a lot more of their time. Yeah, it seems like deck building, I know from my experience back in college, deck building was so much of the fun is, is finding these cards and, and putting them together and figuring out cool ways for them to work. And then so playing a game against my buddy wasn't even necessarily like, oh, I need to win. It was like, OK, I'm going to play test this deck and see if it's as good as I hope it will be and I can tweak it. Is that what you've kind of found early on with the play testers way back when? And you just kind of kept that going? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. A, a lot of how it is. And in fact, uh, some players, I think many players even uh, – uh, aren't even using the decks as a stepping stone to a winning deck. What they're doing is they've got some deck concept and they're happy if they win, you know, one in five games. Uh, they feel very good about that. Um, and uh, uh, so it's sort of a game world to explore. In fact, their attitudes uh, often allow for some really interesting things where uh, they intentionally play these things, whether the underdog and the other person has a much stronger deck or stronger players. Um, that uh, it, it feels it's it's uh, pretty cool having a game where one person has a twenty percent chance to win, and uh, it feels very special when they do win, and uh, you know the other person gets to dominate them uh, four times out of five. Um, <laughs> So uh, that can be a win-win situation. So the, uh, the other thing I look for when I'm uh, making a, a trading card game is it's very important what the elements of the cards are. You want to make it so that uh, players uh, want to collect that element. Um, so that is why a game with a bunch of creatures uh, or a bunch of objects or a bunch of places is more interesting than is, is, is probably going to be more successful than a game where you've got a bunch of uh, moves like left punch, right punch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these uh, more abstract things don't translate as well into cards, which don't make because they're not as and, and they're not as tangible. So uh, it uh, I think is, uh, is is stronger to have uh, uh, people putting together decks of things they find cool. Yeah, definitely. Now, what were some of the rules that maybe weren't in the original concept of the game that as more people got their hands on it and started to kind of break things and do things differently, what were some of those things that, that you learned there? For instance, like having limits on the number of the of, of a card, a specific card that someone could have in their deck. Was that there from the beginning or is that something you kind of had to do later? And what were some other things like that? Uh, the limit on the number of cards was added later. Um, and in fact, uh, originally the way I anticipated trading card games being played was that people would buy uh, one or two decks and some boosters. And, uh, and that was the end of it. They and traded. That was it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, and so there wasn't any need for any uh, limit and to boot. Uh, uh, I thought that if somebody traded and made it a deck, made a deck for instance of all lightning bolts and mountains, whether or not that was a dominating deck, it's pretty good, yeah. um, and but it's not fun to play against. Right. And so, you know, that would be like uh, if, if if I went to somebody's house and they played a game with a with a a, a, a power that was 
you know, too broken, we'd say, okay, you can't play with that anymore. And so uh, I expected people to do more self-moderation. Hmm. But uh, I came from an era where there were a lot of house rules in our games. And, uh, and But as the game became played more seriously and people had larger collections, we had to uh, take this balancing more, more seriously. And uh, this rule of uh, a limit of four uh, in the deck really helped a lot. Later on, in Netrunner, in fact, I tried to get rid of that. And I, I tried to design it from the get-go so that you could have as many as you liked of a particular card. And uh, people did not like that, even if it was possible. And it took me a little while to get it through my head that, that, that it just really helped people by giving them bounds, like that they, uh, that they didn't have to worry whether they needed six of these things or seven or 20 of them, uh, that having a limit of three or four is, is very helpful to the players. So that's another reason to put these limits in. Gotcha. So giving players constraints actually helps the game, uh, actually helps people enjoy the game more. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, makes it seem less overwhelming. And, and I mean, trading card games are cr- crazy overwhelming to begin with. So if you can give them uh, some walls, uh, it, it's often useful. So another uh, thing I would advise for somebody making a trading card game is to try to aim for cards and strategies that are loved and hated uh, as opposed to ones that everybody thinks are just okay. Mm -hmm. There was a a lot of pressure at the beginning to make it so that magic, there were some groups who felt like magic should be uh, creatures with spells as spice. And they didn't like to see land destruct. They didn't like to see card discard. They didn't want to see uh, uh, decks that were almost all spells. And uh, I found that the that the that anything which anybody hated, uh, if there were people out there that loved it, that it was uh, it it just made the game much richer by putting it in there, but making sure that it didn't uh, you know it didn't become so common that people had to deal with it all the time. Yeah. So if it's out there, the people who hate it. It's sort of this dangerous spice that's out there that occasionally they have to play this game they hate. But for the people who love it, it's like the entire game. They love it. Yeah, so you're saying have some polarizing strategies. Yep, yep, yep. Have polarizing strategies. Just make sure that the ones that are, uh, are, are super hated don't dominate. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then, and then uh, that's much more exciting, I think, than just stripping everything out so that everybody, so that it's more, the, whole, the entire game's more vanilla. Gotcha. All right, one, one last question before some final thoughts. How do you playtest one of these things? Like, what have you learned about playtesting over the last 25 years for a game like this? Well, uh, you, you need a broad... Uh, a broad group of play testers. Uh, there's no one answer, and uh, you need to make sure that some some of the play testers are represent all the different uh, psychographics. So you need some people who are taking winning very seriously, and you need to have have it so that uh, some people who are playing for big swingy effects or combos are are playing that don't care necessarily as much about winning, and that you have uh, both good players and bad players or I should say experienced and inexperienced. And that's, that's daunting, but, uh, but it's really important to get these things broadly play and tested. Um, the second thing is that it's really hard to catch everything. Um, and if I, I would go so far as to say that if you've caught all the problems with your game, you probably have not been ambitious enough. Hmm. Uh, games are very complicated Games like these are very complicated, and part of the joy of them is exploring the wild unknowns of these games. So you want to make sure they're in the game. And uh, the combinatorial nature of it is such that, that you just can't get all the combos uh, uh, if, if you're aggressive with them. Um, and, and so uh, I would be easier on yourself and just have some method of uh, correcting mistakes after release. Uh, it's painful to do, but but um, but uh, I think I think if a game launches a little more aggressively with the combos and some of them are a little broken, but you can tweak them back, that's going to be more satisfying than everything is sort of more reined in. And in fact, at one point at Wizards, we have uh, design teams 
and development teams. And the design teams come up with the design and the development teams uh, make sure that they're not too broken and balanced. Um, at one point, we were talking about how to uh, measure the design, the development team's success. And the obvious thing was no broken cards. The idea was put forth, and uh, I still subscribe to it, that, uh, that actually the ideal thing is that there's a couple broken cards every year. Mm -hmm. um, if you have 10, you know, that's too much. But if you have none, that means they're just not trying. Hmm. Gotcha. Well, man, this, this has been awesome. Do you have any kind of like closing advice or you know, closing thoughts for somebody working on a CCG? If you're working on a TCG, I would say uh, begin by nailing down your vanilla stuff. Just uh, uh, in, in magic, that would be the very simple creatures with no abilities and uh, the very simple abilities. Uh, just get those down first before trying to do anything super fancy. And then once you've got that down and it feels like a, 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 a pretty good uh, structure, then it's uh, really easy to add in cards that tweak those, uh, add to them, subtract from them, uh, and uh, spin the game off hopefully into uh, wild and unknown areas. Gotcha. Richard, man, really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show, and uh, good luck with everything you got going on right now. Hey, thanks for the interest. Uh, it was fun.